over and over again. Wait, which chord? This one? For or your for your for your glory? The, or nothing but the blood. Which I play the same. Oh, so like a D D. Yeah, like the D D C minor, whatever. Um. Okay. Good morning, friends. I appreciate the fact that you're here with us this morning. Whether you're joining us in person or you're joining us online uh, through the live stream, uh, we are glad for your participation as we come to worship the Lord. Hear this call to worship. To all who are weary and need rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who feel worthless and wonder if God cares, to all who fail and desire strength, to all who sin and need a savior. This church well, opens wide her doors and with a welcome from Jesus Christ, who is the ally of his enemies, the defender of the guilty, the justifier of the inexcusable, and the friend of sinners. Welcome. I'd like to take time now to invite the praise team uh, to lead us in songs of praise to our God. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the English ministry worship. Um, yeah, so before we sing, I'm going to open us and a quick word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for bringing us here today to worship and praise you. Um, yeah, I just pray that as we sing, we'll be able to lift our voices high and glorify your name. Um, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you all to stand uh, if you are willing.
close us in a word of prayer. Um, dear God, thank you for bringing us here um, and that we're able to gather in person but also online um, just to join in fellowship with one another. And um, I thank you for your reckless love for us and um, that it's never ending. And I pray that you would speak through Pastor Nathan as he preaches and that you would bless the rest of um, this morning. So I pray all this in your name. Amen. As you in person are finding your seats, uh, I welcome you to find your bulletin. Uh, you can find the bulletin online. Uh, you can find it by going to cbcgl.org, going to ministries, English ministry, weekly bulletin, and an announcement. And uh, you get to this page. I pulled it up on another tab so you can see a little better. Um, today, uh, you might be wondering why I am at home rather than there with you in person. Well, it's because uh, I'm working at following the uh, the guidelines for COVID. Uh, according to our COVID guidelines, if a family member has a sore throat uh, or a cough, then you're staying home. So that's the case with our family. A um, couple of individuals in my family have a sore throat, and uh, so staying home out of an abundance of caution. Um, but we have good reason to think it's just a cold. Uh, so thanks for your prayers and, and concern. Uh, continue to pray for us and for those who are dealing with uh, sickness and illness. Other announcements I have for you is that today uh, there is a bylaw information meeting that's gonna be held in Mandarin um, so that we can share what the changes are to the bylaw because we're voting on that, those changes next week. Um, so if you want to hear more about what's gonna be there and you understand Mandarin, feel free to attend. The Zoom link is in the bulletin. Uh, we do want to let you know that you are cordially invited and welcomed to attend uh, the State of the Church meeting that's happening next Sunday uh, at 1.30 p.m. There is a vote that we're going to be doing uh, regarding the revised version of the bylaw because uh, it does need the congregation to approve the revision. Um, all members are invited and in fact if you know the bylaw as a church member you are expected to attend the meeting. Um, and so we, we want you to know that you don't just have to attend this meeting, you get to attend this meeting with us. So please mark in your calendar 1.30 p.m. next Sunday. Another thing that's happening today is there's a ladies fellowship meeting uh, starting at 2 p.m. Uh, they'll be sharing about uh, missions from uh, Sister Connie Yu, who's a missionary in the UK, and Sister also Shi, uh, who's a USA member of COCM. Uh, the sharing will be done in English. You can join that link via Zoom uh, at 2 p.m. Other things I want to let, let you know um, is uh, accepting donations uh, with the church because uh, we're part of the one church that we have. Um, but you can donate by giving online to Zelle or mailing a check. Um, information is listed in the bulletin there. Other things you need to know is that um, we have uh, children's ministry, because even if they're not joining in person, um, we do still have children's ministry activities on Friday nights, Sunday mornings, and we are planning for VBS. So we're looking for VBS volunteers. Um, if you're interested in helping kids to know Jesus and advance the kingdom, uh, bring the gospel to all peoples, which include children, um, then we invite you to participate with us August 9th to 13th. Um, also, if you have kids, you're welcome to register your kids for VBS, or you have grandkids, uh, welcome to help have them register for VBS. Uh, we're planning to have a two-hour online session in the morning with optional after-camp activities that are in person. Registration deadline is July 11th, uh, 2021. So we're having registration quite early right now, but we do, we do want to let people know that it's available. Um, another announcement I have for you that's not in the bulletin uh, is that I sent an email out this week letting you know that the English congregation is uh, working at moving towards seeing if there's a name that we can agree on that we would like to name ourselves. Uh, more information about that is in that email and also in the link where you can vote on a name. There's about 12 different possible names that uh, we select from. Uh, or if you have another name that you want to like 
get all your friends to say, vote for this name. And then everyone puts that name in the other category. Uh, then we're, we're trying to get the top three possible names so that in, but in two weeks time, we can take those top three names and then do a final vote and see if we can't come to uh, a final name for the English congregation. Um, we do wanna make sure that you as members know that uh, we wanna do this with consensus and understanding and unity. Uh, so if you have specific questions or concerns, please do not hesitate to reach out. You can let me know, you can uh, contact Elder Wu uh, or Deacon Gu, and um, we'd be glad to talk to you about the process and the concerns that you have to make sure that we're moving together uh, towards the goal of uh, naming the English congregation. That's all the announcements that I have for you. Um, So I'd like to share the sermon with you. Um, so if you have a Bible, please turn in it to Luke chapter 20. Uh, we will be we'll be hearing from God's word from Luke chapter 20 uh, in verses 9 to 15. It was a beautiful plot of land. The way that the hills sloped, uh, the color of the earth, the abundance of water all made this land an ideal spot for a vineyard. The owner of the land had decided to plant a vineyard here in order to enjoy the fruit. The fruit of the vineyard could be made into all sorts of goods, and the vineyard could produce significant wealth. In times gone by, a vineyard like this one that he was planning to plant could bring in a thousand pieces of silver a year. It was only a matter of time before the fruit would come. So the man got to work. He called his son and together they cleared the ground. They laid out the rows. The son measured the space between the cuttings of the vines. Then they planted his vineyard. In the coming weeks and months, father and son watered it and tended it as it took root. And the vineyard's owner eagerly anticipated the goodness and fruitfulness that the vineyard would produce. Soon afterwards, some business needed to be attended to in another country. So the owner decided to move his family. But what would they do with the vineyard? Well, they did what most landowners did back then. They kept it as a rental property. They found some tenants. These were people who were hired to care for the vineyard. See, the tenants, they didn't have money themselves. They hadn't bought the vineyard. They weren't renting it out. Instead, they came to take care of the vineyard on behalf of the owner. The owner worked out an agreement with these tenants that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard at a later date. These tenants only had to work the land and care for the vine so that they themselves could benefit. They would enjoy the fruit of the vineyard while the owner was away. And as it turns out, the owner of the vineyard was away for a long time. This was a modern day when the owner could simply ask the foreman to give him a video tour of the vineyard to check in. There was no way for the tenants to transfer money to him on a regular basis. This was a time when there was no telephone, no internet, no way for the owner to obtain wealth from his vineyard in his absence. In order to enjoy the fruit, he would have to come back. And so in the years after the owner had left, the tenants had reaped harvest after harvest after harvest. The fruit of the vineyard had enabled them to become independently wealthy. They had enough resources so that they could hire servants to help with the harvest. Because the land was so good and the harvest was so great, the tenants needed help to bring in the harvest. So they hired workers to help them bring these things in. And this continued for a few years and things seemed to be going great. And even as their wealth grew, so too inside them grew this hope that the owner wouldn't come back. In those days, if a piece of property was unclaimed by an heir, a descendant, then the land could be declared ownerless and claimed by others. So after years of absence, these tenants had begun to think of themselves as the owners. Things seemed to be going incredibly for them. That is until until one day during the grape harvest, a man shows up. 
he asked some of the workers if he could speak with those who were in charge of the place. The workers explained, it's, it's you know, the harvest, they're in the middle of harvest, so you need to wait until evening. So the man waited. And when the tenants came in with the workers, the workers introduced the man to the tenants. He explained that his master had sent him. His master was the owner of the vineyard. He had come to receive from them some of the wealth which came from the fruit of the vineyard. But can you imagine how these tenants must have felt? The arrival of the stranger came as something of a shock. It would kind of be like if the IRS were to send you an email or give you a phone call and tell you that they're going to do an audit of your taxes. It caused a bit of anxiety among the tenants. But because of the tenants' imaginary ownership of the vineyard, they declined payment. They felt that since they had done the work, they could do what they wanted with the vineyard. After all, who was this representative of the owner anyway? What authority did he have? The tenants weren't going to pay him. And they weren't polite about it either. To get their message across, they turned to violence. When the servant of the owner of the vineyard insisted on payments, the tenants beat him. They bloodied and bruised him and kicked him on his way out. They paid him nothing. After all, they had worked in the vineyard. It was theirs, or so they thought. The truth is that they were tenants. They were merely caretakers. They had enjoyed the fruit of the land for years, and this was the first time that anyone had come asking for payment. But it wasn't the last time. About a week later, another man came. He explained that he too had been sent by the owner of the vineyard. He had come on the authority of the owner. He was there to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. He explained that he was to receive payment on behalf of the owner. He told them the owner was not happy with how they had acted. But in their hardness, in the hardness of their hearts, because of the lies that they had come to believe about themselves, thinking that they owned the place, they treated the servant the same way that they had treated the other one. Except this time, they added insult to injury. They beat the servant and insulted him. Any objective assessment of the situation would clearly show that they had treated the servant shamefully. In the fury of their obscenity-laced tirade, they attacked the servant, leaving him bloodied and bruised, more bloodied and bruised than the first servant, and they sent him away, having paid him nothing. The harvest was about half complete when another servant came. But by this time, the tenants would have none of it. As soon as the servant explained that he had come in the name and the authority of the owner and that the owner was angry, they replied that their anger was fiercer. They beat him cursed him, mistreated him, and sent him away in rags with even less than what he had come with. Now, can you imagine what the owner of the vineyard was thinking? It was his vineyard. He had planted it. He had tended it. He had graciously given those tenants the opportunity of a lifetime. They could enjoy the fruit, but they had agreed that they would provide him with fruit or wealth from the vineyard. Three times he had sent a servant with his authority to them. Three times they had assaulted his servants, leaving them bloodied and bruised. What was he to do? This was not how things were supposed to be. He decided that he would send his son. His son looked like him, sounded like him, even represented him. If the tenants hadn't recognized the authority of his other servants, they would recognize the authority of the son. If they would respect anyone, they would respect his beloved son. So the son, the beloved son of the owner, took the same path as the servants who had gone before him and made his way to the vineyard. By this time, the harvest was nearly over, and the tenants, they were stressed out. Three times now they had repelled the servants of the owner. They were fed up. They agreed to kill the next person who came asking for fruit from their lucrative vineyard. When the sun showed up, still a long way off, they recognized him. They thought, maybe the owner died. And if he did, then this is the heir. This is the owner of the vineyard. So they said to one another, are you thinking what I'm thinking? One of the tenants said, we should kill him. If we do, the 
inheritance will be ours. No one will come asking for fruit anymore. We'll have this vineyard all to ourselves. It's ours anyway. It has been for years. Let's get rid of the sun. So that's what they did. As, as the son arrived at his father's vineyard, asking for the tenants, they instantly assaulted him. They threw him out of the vineyard, and they killed him. They took him outside of the vineyard because they didn't want his blood on their grapes. In their minds, they had removed the problem. They could now have or do whatever they wanted. But what do you think the owner of the vineyard would do to those tenants? I mean, what would you do? They killed your son. They stole your property. They ignored your authority. They repeatedly refused your requests that they keep up their end of the agreement. And in their folly, they had the audacity to murder your beloved son, your only son. What should the owner of the vineyard do? Jesus had told this story to the crowd who had gathered. They were shocked. This is not your typical bedtime story. This is a story of wrongdoing and wrath. It's a story of betrayal, beatings, and bruises. It's a story of the murder of the son of the owner of the vineyard. But Jesus gives the punchline, answering his own question. Says, I'll tell you what the owner of the vineyard will do. He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. In their shock, the crowd exclaimed, there's no way. God forbid. It can't be. But Jesus looks them straight in the eye and drops another truth bomb in the form of a question. How is it then that the scripture says, the stone the builders have rejected has become the cornerstone? He continues and explains, everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. I'm going to let that just sink in a short while. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Jesus didn't tell this story for no reason. The religious leaders had questioned Jesus' authority. But when they had questioned him, they couldn't reply. More than that, the religious leaders had been plotting against him. You see that in the verses prior to Luke chapter 20, verse 9. They were seeking to destroy him. You see that at the end of chapter 19. In fact, they would have arrested him that very hour, but they were afraid of the crowds. You see that in verse 19. They weren't afraid of God. They weren't afraid of the authority of Jesus. They were afraid of losing things that they technically never independently possessed, namely religious authority. Jesus told this parable to teach them a number of things. First, he is sharing this allegorical parable to point out that he is God's beloved son. In allegory, is a poem or a picture that can be interpreted to reveal uh, some hidden meaning. That hidden meaning is typically a moral or political point. Here in this parable, Jesus is doing both. The owner of the vineyard is God. The tenants are the religious leaders in Israel. The servants are the Old Testament prophets who have been rejected by the people of Israel throughout the centuries. Just listen to one of more than 10 Old Testament references to this reality. From 2 Chronicles 36, 15 to 16, it says, The Lord had sent persistently to them by his messengers because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people until there was no remedy. See, this problem was nothing new. But now, God was doing something new. He had sent his beloved son. The phrase beloved son repeats the echo of the voice from heaven 
which sounded in Luke chapter 3 during Jesus' baptism. So morally, Jesus is showing them what they are doing. He's encouraging them to make their own judgment about what's right. They were the tenants who were going to throw him out of the vineyard, throw Jesus out of Jerusalem and have him killed. Politically, Jesus is pointing out that he has the authority. He comes as a representative of his father. But due to their pride, due to their selfishness, due to their self-centeredness, they had rejected his authority. And so God will reject them. One commentator notes that the religious leaders in Jesus' day had called themselves the builders of Israel. So Jesus in this story is basically just spelling it out for them. They had rejected him, and for that, they would be rejected. The blessings which they had long enjoyed would be given to others. Jesus is signaling the inclusion of the Gentiles, which is highlighted later in Luke's second book, The Acts of the Apostles. Jesus is making a moral and political statement. But to be clear, Jesus was not rejecting the Jewish nation because the vineyard represented the people of God. Um, and the owner of the vineyard doesn't reject the vineyard. He rejects the tenants, those religious leaders who had rejected him. So the allegory points to the fact that Jesus is God's son. And they were rejecting him. The second thing that Jesus teaches them is that he is the stone of wrath. Have you ever heard that before? Jesus is the stone of wrath? One pastor points out the religious leaders would have readily noted uh, that the reference to the stone is a familiar symbol of God and the promised Messiah from the Old Testament. Jesus quoted from Psalm 118 to state that he was the most important stone. The stone the builders have rejected has become the cornerstone or the capstone. One commentator explains, it may have been a large stone that was set at the corner in the foundations. In this way, it would determine the, determine the position of the two walls and so shape the whole building. Or it may have been the stone at the top of the wall, binding the whole thing together and consummating the work. Either way, regardless of which type of stone it was, it was one of great importance. So even if they had rejected him, God had not rejected his son. Even if they had rejected the stone, God had not rejected him. Jesus was, is, and will be the one to whom God has given all authority, no matter what others do to him or do with him. So in verse 18, Jer Jesus clarifies with language from Isaiah 8, verses 14 and 15, and Daniel chapter 2, verses 34 and 35. He says, everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Those who stumble at the proclamation of the gospel of Christ will be broken. But when Christ returns and brings about his kingdom, there will be no second chance. Christ came to redeem sinners. When Jesus returns, comes back again, he will come to judge. He is warning them that if they persist in being enemies of God, they will be crushed. Some older commentators translate this last phrase about it will crush him to it will grind them to dust. Since it recalls the imagery of that destructive stone in Nebuchadnezzar's dream from Daniel chapter 2. Or as the catechism states, those who reject Christ will be justly and grievously punished forever. Jesus was showing them that he is the stone of wrath even as he is the savior of the world. Not only did the parable teach them important truths about who Jesus was, God speaks to us today through the same parable. I can see three things that this parable teaches us. First, this parable points out the insidious nature of sin. 
sin, sin works in our lives kind of like poison. Kind of like a local anesthetic they use at the dentist, sin numbs us. Like looking into the sun for too long, sin blinds us. Sin dulls our response to sin so that we can't see or feel our own deepening self-destruction. What once may have shocked us regarding sin, we now feel like it's not a big deal. Oh, it's not a big deal. Walking the way of the broad path, we have traveled farther than we would like to admit. This can be seen in the religious leaders of Jesus' day. As Warren Wearsby points out, these religious leaders had permitted that John the Baptist be killed by Herod. Then they had requested that Jesus be killed. And after Jesus rose from the dead, they themselves had killed Stephen with their own hands. The progression into sin is described in Psalm chapter 1. Walking in the counsel of wicked, standing in the way of sinners, and finally ending up sitting in the seat of mockers. Or Matthew Henry points out that those that live in neglect of their duty to God, namely they sin, they know not what degrees of sin and destruction they are running themselves into. Friends, this morning, let this parable be a wake-up call. You cannot continue living as if God doesn't care about how you behave. The more you sin, the more you will be prone to sin. The more you sin, the less you will fight against sin in your life. And by degrees and by self-justification, you will end up destroying others and being destroyed in the process if you continue in it. The tenants, they lived as if the owner didn't exist. Friends, could, could it be said of you that you're doing the same? Are you living your life as if God doesn't exist? If so, beware. Sin is crouching at your door and it desires to have you. Not only does this parable highlight the insidious nature of sin, it also reveals to us the incredible nature of God. Right at the beginning of the parable, Jesus points out that God is the owner of everything. He created the world. He built it. And he can do what he wants with it because it's his. But he graciously gave his precious vineyard to be cared for by these tenants. He allowed them to enjoy uh, the blessings of the vineyard. And when it came time for, them to for him to receive what was due, he was persistent. Think about it. He didn't come in wrath after the first servant was merely beaten. He sent another. And when they beat the second servant, he didn't come in wrath. He sent yet another. He had given them chance after chance after chance. And in this way, it can be easily seen that God is long-suffering. Friends, my my concern for you is that do you think that God is just up in heaven waiting for you to mess up? That he's just waiting around so that he can punish you? If so, correct your misunderstandings. The God who made the world and everything in it is incredibly gracious. God is loving. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. You might be wondering how we can say that God is loving if he sends Jesus as a stone of wrath. Well, we tend to think that someone who is wrathful or angry is not loving. And certainly in our experience with others, love is often the last thing that we assume when one of our relatives is angry. But God is not like us. God is wrathful against sin precisely because he is loving. Theologian Michael Reeves says, God is angry at sin because he loves. See, it is not that God is naturally angry, but that evil provokes him. In his pure love, God cannot tolerate 
evil. Or Dane Ortland, in his best-selling book of 2020, Gentle and Lowly, he explains, God's holiness finds evil revolting, more revolting than any of us could ever feel. But it is that very holiness that also draws his heart out to help and to relieve, protect, and comfort. Again, we must bear in mind that the all-crucial distinction between those who are not in Christ and those who are in Christ, those who have trusted Jesus for salvation and those who have rejected Jesus. For those who do not belong to Jesus, sin evokes holy wrath. How could a morally serious God respond otherwise? But for those who do belong to him, who put their trust in Jesus, sins evoke this holy longing, holy love, holy tenderness. God does not, indeed cannot, tolerate sin. But that's exactly why he sent his son. Jesus is not only the stone who will bring wrath, Jesus is the stone who took God's wrath for us. Jesus died in our place, taking our sin upon himself along with its penalty, the wrath of God, so that he might give us life. He took those of us who were rebels against him and called us out of our rebellion to follow him. That's in fact why Peter in Acts chapter 4 explains. He says, let it be known to you, to all of you, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Yes, in Peter's day, they had rejected Christ. But Peter's telling them, you can still be saved. You just have to put your trust in Christ, in Jesus. Peter was calling them not to stumble at the incredible grace of God revealed in the gospel. The correct response is to put our trust in Christ for salvation. He is the stone rejected by the builders, which has become the cornerstone. Through Christ teaching this parable, we learn the insidious nature of sin, and we learn the incredible nature of God. And finally, we also learn the fact that our response to Jesus matters. Friends, those of you who are listening, whether live or you're going to be lis you're listening to this re radio recorded, I'm inviting you to check your heart. Are there areas of your lives where you are acting like those tenants? Are you keeping things as if you could? Are you keeping things from God? Are you telling God, you can have every area of my life, uh, except for this one. This area is mine. Are you saying to God, I will give you what you deserve, but not yet? I don't know if you realize this, but your life belongs to him. He's the owner. He made you. He invites you to enjoy the blessings of relationship with him. But because we sin, we often act like our life is our own. It's my time. It's my money. They're my kids. It's my house. And we go on and on about my, 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 me, me, me. We think we can decide what to do. We think we can decide what's best for our lives. And we often do this in spite of his calls to obedience or fruitfulness or faithfulness in the midst of temptation. And when we turn from him, he patiently calls us to respond, to repent, and return to him. 
You see that in the fact that he persistently sent those servants. He makes our return even possible through his son. And if, if we accept his rule and authority in our lives, we welcome Christ to come and be Lord over us so that all of our lives, not just individually, but corporately, all of us, all of our lives, all of each part of our lives belongs to him. We welcome him to come and be Lord over us. So sure, this may mean that he causes you to be broken. In his goodness, he breaks the power of sin in your life. In his mercy, he enables you to become brokenhearted over your sin. And still he invites you. Still he welcomes you. The Christ who came to save sinners is still calling for sinners to come home. While this earth turns, Christ is still calling sinners. Because he is gentle and lowly. In this parable, the owner didn't send his beloved son in judgment, but to give those tenants a chance. But if like those tenants, we reject Christ, we too will be crushed, ruined, destroyed. Listen to the warning from Bishop J.C. Riley. He says, those tenants were too proud to repent. They were too hardened by the deceitfulness of sin to turn away from it. Let us be aware of doing likewise. This parable is a warning. It was a warning to them. It's a warning for us. How we respond to Jesus matters. We must come to him in repentance and trust. There is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Jesus is the stone of wrath. The question is, what kind of wrath will you experience from him? The one where he takes God's wrath on your behalf because you trust him? Or the one where he expresses God's wrath against you because you reject him? Will you respond to trust him to take God's wrath for you? Or will you stand defiantly against him in your sin, asserting that you own the vineyard and that he can go to hell? Friends, he already did. He was willing to take God's wrath for you. He experienced the hellish reality of God's wrath for you. You just have to accept what he's done for you. And accept that he is who he says he is, the Lord of your life, the one who owns the vineyard, who can tell you how to do with your life what needs to be done. So you join him in his purposes. Even if that purpose means going somewhere you don't expect to go, doing things you don't expect to do, loving those you don't expect to love. God is calling you to join him in what he's doing. Because he's willing to take God's wrath for you. You just have to come to him. We'll close with a final quote from, from Dane Orland's book. See, what elicits uh, tenderness from Jesus is not the severity of sin, but whether or not the sinner comes to him. Whatever our offense, he deals gently with us. If we never come to him, we will experience a judgment so fierce that it will be like a double-edged sword coming out of his mouth at us. But if we do come to him, as fierce as that lion-like judgment would have been against us, so deep will be his lamb-like tenderness towards us. We will be enveloped in one or the other. To no one will Jesus be neutral. Let's pray. Father God, uh, you, you give us a warning in this parable. Uh, you warn us about how sin works in our lives. Help us not to treat sin as if it's a light thing, 
So I'm, it's not a big deal. Lord, any time we sin, we're walking away from you. Lord, give us deeper and truer repentance. One that says we're committed to following you in every area of our lives, with all of our lives, so that all the world may know all of your glory. We also thank you that you are so incredible, that you are persistent and patient, that you give us this time on earth so that we may enjoy the blessings that you've given us, but not just so we can enjoy them for ourselves, but so that in our enjoyment of them, we honor glory to you. We may give you what is your due. We may join you in what you are doing now. Bringing people out of darkness, bringing from people from death to life, bringing people from, uh, from, from hopelessness to healing, God, from brokenness to wholeness. Lord, and, and not only doing that in terms of conversion, but in every aspect of our lives, helping us to be more and more like your son, Jesus Christ. Help us to respond to you appropriately, that we would give our lives to you, not just once in conversion, but as Christians every day, walking with you, following you and saying, God, let your will be done in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that you enable us. Thank you that you give us your spirit to live in us, to help us to do that. Help us to share this message of hope with others and also this message of warning. You are the stone of wrath. And we can accept you taking God's wrath on our behalf or we can try to take it on our own and be separated from you forever. Lord, free us from that foolishness. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. I invite the praise team to lead us in a response. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you to Pastor Nathan for sharing that message. So I invite you all to stand as we sing Cornerstone in response.
Brothers and sisters, I really wish I could be with you today in person, but I'm glad to be with you uh, online. Praise God for the technology that allows us to do this. Um, but I want to give you the benediction. So please receive God's blessing. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all we do for you. So that he may establish your hearts blameless in him before God, our God and Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Amen.